Yeah. Hey, folks. Um, uh, so uh, I am a client side engineer on YouTube. I have much less familiarity with the coding tools themselves than y'all. So I'm not going to talk about that part. I'm sure um, there are plenty of conversations you can have. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, actual deployment uh, that we've done. Um, so we've served well over 5 billion hours at this point. Um, AV1 is uh, actively being used in production. Um, if we use it on our absolute most popular videos, it does save us money, uh, technically. Um, uh, but we're uh, aiming to increase the distribution as well. So we're still not operating in a, in a particularly cost-saving focused mode for AV1. Um, it's more about making sure that over the next few years, hardware manufacturers will have had, and software manufacturers, will have had the experience with the codec um, to really put it in production and hit that timetable once it hits hardware and we can start transcoding our um, uh, most expensive to deliver formats such as 4K and HDR, um, that's really when uh, we'll take off. Now, uh, I do say that uh, we'll, uh, some videos are available up to 4K and up to 8K even, and in HDR. Um, um, the way that, well, obviously most computers cannot decode uh, 8K in real time yet. Um, so what we do is we actually, unless a user has explicitly chosen to use um, AV1 at all resolutions, which is a setting that we offer in the, the playback settings uh, dialog box um, on the website, uh, then we split it up using different codec families. And we can do this on the web using uh, source buffer .change type, um, which is a new uh, call that we added to the media source specification. Um, and this allows us uh, to do codec switching. Now, a, a note that I would say uh, to any client-side engineers is, um, this seems like an obvious point in retrospect, but it actually tripped some of our engineers up. We didn't realize we were doing this until we looked into it, um, which is the way to do codec splicing. You don't necessarily need everything to be perfectly aligned, um, but uh, differences of plus or minus one frame were causing a problem when we implemented this on mobile clients. Media source takes care of this automatically just because of its, arch its uh, architecture. But um, the, uh, if your goal is to switch from a lower resolution AV1 codec, to a higher resolution VP9 codec, uh, because of performance limitations, uh, you can't do uh, VP9, or AV1 1080, let's say. Um, then the right way to do it is to truncate the AV1 segment and then switch over to the VP9 segment at a keyframe. And this is just generally good idea. But what we found is that uh, uh, ExoPlayer on Android, um, when we were using it in certain modes, was actually um, getting to the uh, transition point um, and then uh, playing the full AV1 segment. So we would play that segment out for, um, in this case, up until 10 seconds, load the VP9 segment, seek into the VP9 segment, decode a bunch of frames and drop them, and then start playing uh, VP9. And this actually hindered some of our earlier um, codec adaptation efforts when we were trying to do this rolling out VP9 uh, in software. Um, so we just call that out uh, as, a, as a good to know, make sure that you're not doing that. Because especially if you're, um, videos are misaligned by one frame. That means you have to decode and drop an entire segment, essentially. Um, and that was really hurting us. Um, on the web, we have a reactive threshold uh, is our primary mechanism. Um, we try the codec and then see how it performs. Um, and that reactive threshold has two components. One is just a, the, your normal drop frames. Um, and the other is non-network read buffers. If you're a web client engineer, this is definitely something you need to look out for. Um, a non-network read buffer is essentially an indication that the decoder could not keep up. But um, you'd think that that always manifests in drop frames. It doesn't. So if you're doing analysis of decode performance, anything like that, um, you also need to look at whether or not the decoder is keeping up with uh, uh, real time uh, in terms of the number of frames that it's decoded, not just the number of frames that it's dropped, because drop frames accounting is very different across different platforms. Um, and so we also look at non-network read buffers, which is we define here um, it's a waiting event, which is part of the HTML5 spec, or if the playback just stops for a while, um, when the buffer health is good, um, we know that there's a performance problem. Drop frames themselves are also fussy. You'll find cases where they're wildly over-reported, where they're under-reported. Um, so what we've started to do is, uh, instead of just looking at a total count of drop frames, um, we look at, uh, uh, we sample every, uh, on a cadence every five seconds. Um, and then uh, we look at, whether or not we've decoded and dropped a certain percentage of frames, um, that's an indication that we're not doing well um, and need to switch down. Um, and so with these, uh, uh, when, you, when you grab the data for them, it turns out that they end up uh, showing uh, surprisingly low correlation with each other because the failure modes internally to the browser of how they're doing an underrun 
um, are, are just entirely different um, depending on platform specific implementation details. So uh, definitely look for both if you're doing a client side strategy um, and make sure to just have as much comprehensive metrics as you can. You don't need to grab them for every playback, um, but what I would recommend is grab extremely high resolution time series data for a limited number of playbacks. Go back and review those and it'll really help understand all those client side performance problems. Um, now, ultimately what we'd wanna do is be able to just say, can we play AV1 at 720p on this device in this configuration? Is it good for a user um, to save them data as a trade-off for performance? And that's probably not gonna be true if you just can't decode um, AV1 and 720 uh, period on that device in real time. Um, it's also not gonna be true if they're like 20% battery and you have to do it in software. Um, and so making all of those decisions should be the responsibility of the media capabilities API on uh, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, web devices in particular. Um, it turns out that this API doesn't work great yet. Um, YouTube is working with browser manufacturers to share some of the data that we're learning in production. Um, and we're hoping to refine this API over the next few months so that it returns really useful results and you can just rely on this. Um, I will say that one of the best features that we found in lieu of this API is actually just the number of cores on a machine. Um, uh, combined with the maximum screen resolution. So if you know that a device has, um, it turns out it used to be six cores, but uh, David has actually gotten enough performance improvements over the past few um, past few months that now it's four cores. Um, but now if you know that it's four cores and it has a 1080 screen, it can probably play 1080 AV1 just fine, even up to 60 frames per second. Not every machine, but it's a pretty good shot. It's enough that we've rolled this out by default um, uh, to six cores and are now launching to four cores as soon as I can get launch approval from um, uh, our leadership team. Uh, and uh, with, if you only have a 720p screen, it turns out that that probably means you have a lower performance CPU, but you're not gonna try 1080p by default anyway. So um, in that case, uh, using 720p AV1 turns out to be okay too. Um, dual core garbage machines don't even try. Um, we do have them on for like 240 or 360, but uh, uh, it's not really, at that point, it's not saving us and a lot of desktop users are not experiencing it. Um, that said, um, this story is very different in a mobile environment where uh, you might have a lower end machine that can only do AV1 up to 240, but that might be a meaningful difference for your users. Um, there's a, a lot of devices where we're actually looking at, can we roll out um, AV1 at 144p and 240p? And even though this isn't as an operator gonna save us a lot of money in terms of egress, it might save our users a ton of money um, because there are users in emerging markets who will play YouTube for 10 hours a day as a radio service. We're not allowed to offer them audio only mode with our, our uh, relationships with music providers. So um, what we need to do is have a very efficient, reasonably watchable, um, ultra low profile encode. And we actually think that AV1's uh, has a fair shot at delivering that um, in a way that will meaningfully transform the consumption experience of, of hundreds of millions of people. Um, so it's not a particularly flashy use case because uh, it's, you know, it's not something that, that demos well when we're used to pristine video and we can say, we've done this in 1.5 megabits per second, um, which is enormous in that market. Um, that's that 1.5 meg would be a luxury. Um, so uh, we're looking forward to uh, experimenting with that use case with software decode. Now, one problem with that um, is the frame timings right now. Um, we've seen David running at uh, 4K on an iPad, which is a huge, achievement. Um, it speaks to the power of the iPads SOC, but it also speaks to the enormous optimizations for performance that have been done uh, in AV1 software decode. Um, this is a chart of the per frame averages running on a single core. This is x86, but it doesn't really matter for this point. Um, uh, the point here is that we've done a lot of performance uh, uh, tuning for uh, AV1 decode, but we haven't done as much power decoding. Um, and that shows because this is a uh, weighted over 20 frames. So it's it's a heavily smooth, and you can see that the decode time is pretty consistent in that environment. Um, but when you compare it to AV1, sorry, this is VP9's decode time without smoothing, and you see it's pretty spiky. Um, when you overpaint AV1, you see it's much, much worse. Um, and for a mobile SOC, if you're talking about 
a phone that could probably decode 720p when we're done with all the ARM optimizations. Um, if you, what we're really looking to do on those phones is not do 720p because that'll eat through the battery, but like focus on 240, 360p, those lower resolutions, converting those over to AV1 and stretching people's data plans out a lot longer. And for that use case to make sense, you actually need to keep the processor in a low power clock domain and uh, not spin up multiple cores if you can avoid it. Um, so this is not performance, it's longevity. And we'll need to re-optimize a lot of the software targets for that. Um, I understand that, as I understand it, I think that that um, re-optimization work is kicking off, but it's definitely something that we need to pay attention to. Um, to a certain extent, encoders can influence this. Um, I think a lot of these are just uh, the uh, hierarchical B frames. Um, that all hit in, in, a, in a single visible frame packet. Um, so we needed to code five or six frames at once. That might spin up the uh, C SOC and spin it back down. So there might be a, a whole uh, power focus thing. Um, I'm sure we will, f YouTube will formally be participating in that process. Um, I'm not just challenging this it, within a deck. So um, and there's that. Now, of course, the place uh, that we're most excited about in terms of our cost saving um, is to be able to deliver to living room devices, which are always playing in the highest resolution. Um, and uh, for these, we have no store yet because of course we just need to wait for um, hardware to catch up. Um, uh, so for that, I would I would say, hold on. I'm sure uh, a lot of you have a lot of information about uh, the timing on those chips coming out as well. So um, we're really looking forward to those hitting the market. Um, and that's when you'll start to see it um, makes sense for YouTube to really scale up uh, its AV1 delivery because it'll be saving us a ton on network egress. Um, so with that, uh, I'd say, do we want to do questions now? Yeah. Uh, th this is, uh, we've used what we have in production, which uh, as a client side engineer, I'm not even sure of the, like all of the command line flags that we set. Um, I do think that we could make changes um, on both the decode and encode side to smooth out this performance. Um, so I, we haven't done experiments into this yet. I think we'll kick off that problem, that project soon. Yeah, I don't think the encoder has that support yet. Yeah, it's a, it's still. I think we've just put the encoder in level M, uh, but the level support now hasn't really uh, propagated to the YouTube pipeline yet. Yeah, I think um, the Ravi elevator, which looks at a stream, will reset your levels. Okay, cool. Um, I think we had, yeah. Um, are there plans for uh, mixed codec in Android, like ExoPlayer? Uh, yes, so uh, ExoPlayer can support it if you have multiple uh, track renderers, I think. So I'm not an Android engineer, so I'm relaying this information. But um, uh, one of the fun things about it is you can swap track renderers. It's harder to swap track renderers between two media codec implementations. So if you actually rely on the uh, Android native framework for both, because uh, they don't want to trade off the, the, potentially if you have two hardware accelerated media codec things, um, then it's a little bit more complicated. Fortunately, the decoders are improving so fast that you probably want to ship your own decoder anyway. And if you build your own track renderer on top of a decoder, that's easy to turn on and off. Um, there's a little bit of massaging you have to do to make sure you have media pre-cached um, uh, in the uh, earlier components, the network stream reader or whatever it's called. Um, uh, but I, uh, I've seen demos that work really smoothly and they're using uh, David underneath and uh, uh, the media codec implementation for AV1 when it, or VP9 when it's available. Uh, so, in the er so the earlier comment about levels, uh, you shouldn't only consider levels, but you should also realize that you do have coding tools in AV1 that you can disable and enable based on complexity. You can create a complexity profile on the encoder side. We can tag the bit streams based on the complexity of the tools that are enabled. So if you know, you not only analyze, you know, like uh, what is happening in terms of the entire tool set, you should probably analyze what tools are actually creating the spikes and potentially create, you know, like a profile that says, you know, this particular tool, like uh, let's say you're like uh, deblocking or you're like uh, whatever loop filters we have or you know, whatever motion compensation prediction tools we have adds this much complexity in the coding process and profile them in the encoder and say, okay, I will create a bitstream that doesn't use these tools, 
okay and that will still be an av1 bit stream that is a lower complexity bit stream that can be you know like decoded within my limitations uh, up to now i don't think that has been done okay but that's something that should be considering doing because that would really help you know like uh, not switch between one codec to another codec but switch between the same codec but with different complexity and codings used within the same codec just just something to consider because uh, other people have done it you know like an mpeg that is green mpeg as well that was actually you know like tagging uh, bit streams based on their complexity and that allows a single decoder to decode all the bit streams but you know like selectively choose the ones that are more let's say appropriate for your application just just a comment you know. Yeah, I think that's a, a great strategy to continue to tune those low-end profiles. I think that for large CDNs, um, the need for backwards compatibility means we already have a lot of those older formats on the edge anyway, so it's lower cost for us to just use them when we can. Um, but definitely for optimizing new formats, um, going tool by tool is a strategy that we'll, we'll pursue. Uh, following up on Alexi's uh, comment, would you be open to a lower profile? Uh, I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm open to anything, but I'm not a codec engineer. So, no, but do you think it will confuse users? Uh, I users don't know about which codec we're using, so uh, I don't think that we have um, uh, we we don't have a we have a responsibility to just make it work for users at, at the, our scale. They don't need to know the details. Some do because YouTube like nerds use YouTube too, um, but uh, overwhelmingly our users are, uh, uh, don't even relate the numerical options in the quality selector back to individual qualities. Um, it's very useful when users do, that's where we get our best feedback from and, and how we learn, um, but that's not, we don't ever need a user to understand any of that. Okay, yeah, because we did the experiments and cut the complexity in half, mm -hmm. only reducing video encoding quality by 10%. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, we'll look into that, I'm sure. Cool. I'll, I'll also let you govern timing. Yeah, let's have two more questions. I think uh, maybe Lucas first and then Andrew. Yeah. Um, yeah. I would imagine that. Well, the other way around. Okay. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I would imagine that these frames that take too long time, it's just a collection of several uh, frames in one packet. Mm -hmm. So, have you tried decoding them separately? Would you get more or less uniform decoding time in this case? So, I, I, I mean, again, yeah, like we haven't tried anything yet. Um, we're going to kick off the project for software decoding um, uh, or, or uh, power consumption oriented software decoding. Um, we need to get, we're not there yet. So, we have not okay. yet tried it. Uh, and, and actually, do, do you have your own decoder or is it the manufacturer's? API that I, I mean do do you have a possibility to actually uh, measure how how long it takes for for each of these frames in the uh, collection to to be decoded so this is in particular this is all software where that matters if it's a hardware mm -hmm. encoder or it's hardware decoder usually the um, uh, it doesn't use power unless it's actually decoding a frame so uh, I don't I don't have the like actual like sub transistor level. Uh, ammeter data, but uh, we don't. We're not concerned about power consumption for hardware decoders this time. Last question. Please. Yeah, I was just a comment uh, regarding the um, different sequence that you'd use different sequence for different types of decoders. Like you do encoding decisions on that. Um, like if a company wants to do it, that's fine. But I don't think that should be an AOM thing because you'll have hardware decoders, software decoders. Like you already have this very heterogeneous system where you have all these different codecs to see different resolution, different bit rate. If we start adding in the decoder, it's just gonna make it's gonna make things even more complicated. So if some company wants to do it, that's fine. I just don't think it should be part of AOM. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, cool. Thanks, Steve.